Okay, so let's get going. Uh, very happy to introduce Kulip. Some of you may already know him. He's uh, our alumnus and he also is visiting us regularly and also been working with us. Uh, so Kulip is currently pursuing his PhD at Rice University with Sadhguru uh, Mahdi. He has been uh, doing a very good work on uh, both sampling and counting in combinatorial spaces. And uh, he's going to talk about that today. He recently uh, was also awarded the uh, Vienna uh, College of Logic and Algorithms Best Master's Thesis Award, which was awarded by competition. Uh, and some of the stuff here is part of that work. I believe he was talking about something more. Yeah. Uh, so okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Supertik, for hosting me here. I'm really Happy to be here back in the institute. So, I'll be discussing uh, work that I have been doing on sampling um, mostly. And uh, before I get into why sampling uh, in combinatorial spaces is important, let's uh, start with a simple example. Uh, so, <coughs> all right. So, um, I guess one of the big problems that uh, all of us as uh, designers. Uh, face is how do we guarantee that the systems we design work correctly. And this is the part of uh, what we now call as functional verification, where given a design, we are trying to verify whether it satisfies the functionality that we desire. In functional verification, there are usually two parts. One is formal verification, uh, where the idea is to model the system formally and then use formal tools to verify the system. Um, about 10 to 15 percent of the verification effort in industry um, goes through this paradigm. And uh, key challenges that AM uh, uh, prohibited going from uh, more than 10 to 15 percent are writing formal specifications is hard. All of us are not really wired to write uh, complicated mathematical expressions and also the scalability of the formal <coughs> tools. So what uh, in last three to four decades what has emerged as the dominant approach is dynamic verification. So what is dynamic verification? Well, we have a design and uh, what we do is we simulate the design with test vectors. And uh, these test vectors uh, sort of represent different verification scenarios. So once we simulate the design, we have the results, we can compare the results with the specification. And if uh, design satisfies the specif uh, if the results satisfy the specifications and we try it for large number of test vectors, we get some confidence. and we say in the industry, um, someone says, okay, well, um, we are now ready to go. However, the big challenge here is the space of test vectors can be really huge. How large it can be? Well, um, let's take a very simple toy example. Uh, our computers are far more complicated than, than this. I guess all of us will agree with this. Here we have two inputs A and B, both are 64 bit input, C is um, let's say some output uh, which is again 64 bit and C is some function of A and B. So if you want to design, if you want to test this circuit, how do we do it? Well, we can try for all combinations of A and B, um, how many combinations it will be uh, since this is 64 bit, so we have to rest to 64. Uh, values of A and similarly for B, so we end up with 2 raised to 128 possibilities. Really huge number, um, without going too much into whether sun will go now or not, but this is not uh, scalable certainly. So uh, this was uh, identified in, in uh, early 90s and uh, uh, the approach, oh, um, what, uh, what was proposed is that um, the circuit is not going to fail on every um, all kinds of inputs. There are some kinds of inputs where the circuit probably has uh, a more likelihood of failing. And uh, these uh, kind of constraints can come from different, uh, uh, different sources. So here I have put some constraints. The idea is for you not to read these constraints, but to just to say that these, are, these do get complicated. So usually the constraints come from designers where the designer might say, well, I, you know, I have designed this circuit, but uh, these are the parts where I don't have fully confidence. From the past experience where we have a, um, 
we have designed similar circuits and we have seen them failing over some values of a and b so once we have these constraints uh, now uh, solutions of these constraints represent our test vectors so what we want to do so these are the, our verification scenarios where we want to verify our uh, simulate our uh, circuit and uh, so every solution to this constraint represent one of the possible test vector however the space of uh, solutions represented by this constraint is still huge um, in real world it gets more than uh, 2 raised to 100 to 2 raised to 150 it's still very huge space, uh, so we cannot still try on all uh, combinations. But anyway, coming back to our problem, so uh, now we have this set of constraints, and uh, what we want to do is we want to uniformly sample the values of A and B, we satisfy these constraints. The question is why uniformly? Well, since we don't, uh, don't have any more information where exactly the bug might lie uniformity is our, our best bet because that will ensure that in expectation we are uh, will are uh, guaranteed to hit a bug in certain uh, number of steps or certain number of uh, uh, tries um, of simulations so let me try to formulate the problem uh, we start with set of constraints which come from variety of sources we can uh, convert them into boolean set, is, uh, set formula. Here I'm sort of uh, abusing the notation by set. I mean boolean formulas. Uh. And now uh, the problem that uh, we want to solve is uh, given this uh, set, uh, set formula, how do we sample satisfying assignments uniformly at random? This is what we call as uh, scalable uniform generation of set witnesses witness represents a satisfying assignment uh, we want it to be uniform and of course the techniques that we design should be scalable uh, because we are, we are going to deal with a really large uh, set of constraints so um, this is not a new problem it has applications in wide variety of areas i have just discussed one application in verification there are applications in probabilistic reasoning, there are applications in uh, multi-agent planning. Uh, so, because it has a lot of applications, there has been a lot of work done over now, since 1980s. What I'm going to do now is to ca uh, categorize the work along two axes. One is guarantees, which means how good the, how, what kind of guarantees the method can provide. Um, specifically, how good the uniformity uh, the method can theoretically guarantee. And on the uh, x-axis, there is performance, which uh, sort of relates how large, uh, the for how large formula the method can handle. So on one extreme, we have techniques uh, which have really good uh, theoretical guarantee of uniformity. Uh, there are methods uh, based on BDD, which stands for binary decision diagram, uh, which give you guarantees of uh, perfect uniformity. However, the problem is, these techniques fail to scale beyond few hundreds of variables. Uh, there was a lot of uh, theoretical work uh, and uh, we sort of culminated with uh, really a seminal work by Bellaric, uh, Godrich and Petronk in 1988, uh, which I am noting by BGP, which again gives you guarantee of uniformity but again fails to scale beyond uh, some 10 to 20 variables. On the other end of the spectrum, we have techniques which have really good performance. These techniques can scale to formulas with hundreds of thousands of variables. However, they come with the keyword that they don't have any guarantee of uniformity. So they will give you distribution, but uh, they can't say much about uh, what, uh, what are the properties of this distribution. So uh, some of the techniques are set-based techniques where you give some uh, random input to the set solver and expect uh, the distribution would be good uh, however in, uh, theory, uh, theoretically you are unable to give any kind of guarantee there are techniques uh, based on monte carlo marco chain uh, where again if you try to implement uh, these techniques in practice you make some assumptions you make some modifications and you lose all the theoretical guarantees <coughs> so how bad they are um, as by the eda industry so at the start of this project uh, we contacted uh, um, some of our uh, partners in the uh, EDA industry in Bay Area and we asked what is it you want? Um, so one way to characterize that uh, we settled on one style which is that let's take a simple set solver. So if the runtime for simple set solver is one unit, 
uh, they are happy if the, if the uniform generator takes about 10 times more time than a simple set solver. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is that this problem is in second level of polynomial hierarchy, so certainly far harder than uh, just doing a set query. So, of course, some degradation is uh, expected and uh, this is what EDA industry um, seems to be happy with. Uh, in 2013, um, the state of art uh, generator which had some sort of guarantees was XR sample prime and its runtime was about 50,000. So, very far off from what EDA industry expects. Some typical examples, yeah. what is the ratio of the size of solutions of these constraints to the size of the entire set? So, the, that ratio is very small. Yeah, um, no, it's very small, but is it like 2 to the minus 50 or something like it's that? It's even worse than that. So, you usually have formulas with uh, 100,000 variables, and so the total space is 2 to 100,000, but uh, you have solutions like 2 to 100, 2 to 150. So, the ratio is very small and uh, that is why some of the technique which is just randomly pick one of the assignment will not work. <laughs> so, over last uh, two and a half years, uh, we have been trying to get to uh, what um, our uh, colleagues in uh, EDA industry design and we proposed a uh, couple of uh, techniques of over last three years. We initially proposed algorithm Univit. Uh, we improved it last year um, in Unigen and this year at Takas Unigen 2. I will discuss uh, the whole journey and uh, what uh, has been sort of the theme across uh, all these works is playing with the independence. And I will uh, discuss in more detail what uh, exactly I mean by dependence in different scenarios and also um, using parallelization to achieve uh, the desired performance. And finally, I will conclude with the um, what uh, has been the lesson so far and some uh, future work that I think will be exciting. So, what is the main idea? Um, so, let us consider this circle to be space of all possible assignments and dots here represent satisfying assignments. So, if, if this set of uh, satisfying assignment was small then I could have just enumerated everything and pick one of the satisfying assignment randomly. However, that is not feasible because we are talking about really huge spaces. So, what if I could partition this solution space into small cells such that every cell has roughly equal number of satisfying assignments and the number of satisfying assignment in every cell is small enough that we can enumerate all of them. If I can do that, so what do I mean by uh, how small they should be? Well, we know that if it is too large, then it will be hard to enumerate. If it becomes very small, when the number of satisfying assignment are just one or two, then the variance gets high because you might either have a solution or not have a solution. So, um, to uh, ca categorize small, we have two parameters, high thresh and low thresh, which depend on how good uniformity you want. So, high thresh is the upper bound on the size of the cell, low thresh is uh, lower bound on the number of satisfying assignment the cell should have. Um, so, for example, in uh, our uh, experiments, uh, low thresh turns out to be 11, high thresh is about 60 for the desired uniformity we want. So, if the number of satisfying assignments is small, then uh, can you enumerate, uh, I mean, how do you know which of these, can you enumerate which of these are satisfying or not? I mean, is it not possible that you might have to travel the entire state of assignments to identify? So, what we uh, assume is access to a set solver at the back end. So, we can just ask set solver, you know, if the number of satisfying assignment is less than 40, you just keep asking. You say, give me one more, give me one more satisfying assignment. So, all of these techniques will be um, what I uh, will be proposing these techniques use set solver at the back end. So, we always assume access to set solver. That is like one unit. Yeah. Like um, one so, that is just uh, our NP oracle. So, set solver returns you the entire set of solutions. No, it returns only one. 
Only one. Yeah. Because if you've already got in ten, you can ask for uh, an eleventh that is different from the first. Yeah, yeah, and that is very simple. And you can just say that, don't give me a satisfying assignment, and it should not be one of these. So going back to your idea, what we want, uh, we want to partition this solution space into small cells. We categorize the small cells by uh, that the number of solutions should lie between low thresh and high thresh. Two parameters which depend on. Uh, the uniformity we want. So once we have this, we can pick a random cell. Remember, it has it does not have too many satisfying assignments, so we'll be able to enumerate all of them, and then we can pick uh, solutions uh, randomly from this cell. How many to pick is going to be the key. So here I sort of gave you the what's going to be the final, but uh, that's what we are going to discuss. So uh, this is uh, how we end up finally, but I will go back in time and try to discuss different ideas of how many solutions we can pick from here. But before we go there, there is a key question which is uh, how can we partition into roughly equal cells without knowing the distribution of uh, solutions? It's a uh, good question and the answer to that comes from the techniques of universal hashing that were proposed by Carter Beckman in 79. So what is universal hashing? Well, so the traditional sense of hashing that we have is we have a hash function that maps from one space to another space. In this case uh, we use n to denote the number of variables. So our space of possible assignment is 0, 1 raised to n and m is the 2 raised to m is the number of cells we want. So uh, this is the uh, space of the cells. So what we are doing is we want hash function that map from 2 raised to n to 2 raised to n. So traditional hashing, we know that if we have random inputs, then all the cells are going to be roughly equal. And, uh, but this is not going to be the case in our case. Um, in our problem, in our problem, we we won't have access. We won't know what kind of uh, formula that we are going to deal with. So uh, this was again observed in uh, different contexts in cryptography, and uh, this led to the work on what is called universal family of hash functions. The idea here is to take randomness away from uh, inputs and put it in in the choice of hash functions. So what we do, we start with a family of hash functions and we choose one of the uh, hash functions randomly from this family. And this choice of randomness ensures that for any arbitrary distribution on inputs or on solutions, all the cells are going to be roughly equal in expectation. However, this is still not good enough in our case because being roughly equal, uh, being equal in expectation does not guarantee that the number of solutions are going to be between the two bounds we were looking for. Um, again, um, this uh, was also observed in uh, cryptography, so this led to work on what is called as R universal hashing. So, uh, for what is R universal hashing? So, this universal hashing guarantees that each solution is hashed uh, uniformly. For R universal, the guarantee that we have is that every R subset of solutions is uh, hashed independently. So what do I mean by that? If we set R to be 2 and we take two solutions Y1, Y2 and two cells alpha1, alpha2, then the probability that our hash function that is randomly picked from this family maps Y1 to alpha1, Y2 to alpha2 is uh, basically the independent event. So this is just the product of the probability. What it intuitively means is that if I, if you can pick a solution y1, I will tell you where it gets mapped to, you will still have no idea about any other solution where it is going to get mapped to. To implement r wise universal hash functions, we require polynomials of degree r minus 1. So as you can see, it get the stronger guarantee we are going to get, uh, we will also require to have higher degree polynomials. So why does this independence matter in our case? Uh, so for this, I'm going to give just a brief uh, idea about uh, some churn of bounds. So what is going to be the theme in uh, all, all these techniques is that, uh, remember, we are going to pick a random cell. 
and then we define some uh, some random variables so the random variables we define is as uh, we set to 1 if the solution if a solution is in the cell otherwise it is set to 0 and then we can use this uh, churn of bound which is that if you have a set of uh, rwise independent variables then let i be the sum of all of these variables so um, and then the probability that i is not too far off from the uh, mean value is uh, so the probability that uh, it is very close to the mean is lower bounded uh, by some number uh, well in this case the other way it is not too far off it is upper bounded by some number uh, which is c raise to minus r so what we are going to have is i is going to represent the number of solutions in our randomly picked cell and this is uh, going to represent how much we deviate from uh, the mean value so if we go back to our idea what we wanted if all the cells have roughly equal number of satisfying assignments so that is going to be mu minus delta mu and mu plus delta mu and <coughs> So, higher R gives us stronger uh, probabilistic guarantees. So, I let everyone stare at it for a while. So, now going back, uh, what we have, we have higher universality that gives us strong guarantees, which is good. Uh, but at the same time, it requires polynomials of uh, a really high degree, uh, which is bad. And this is going to be the trade-off that we are going to play with. Because the idea of uh, partitioning is uh, not at all new. Uh, uh, this uh, was initially initiated by Sipser in '83, and then further work by Bellare, Godrich, and Petron. So, what uh, finally Bellare, Godrich, and Petron showed is that if you choose an n-wise universal H function, then you can guarantee that all the cells are going to be small so the number of solutions are going to be between the two bounds for all the uh, cells and this is going to be true with high, prob uh, high probability and this allows us to uh, uh, allows them to give the guarantee of uh, uniformity however we want to deal with formulas with huh? And it's the number of variables. So we are again going to deal with formula with hundreds of thousands of variables. So it's just not feasible for us to have polynomials of degree, let's say, hundred thousand. So the question we uh, dealt with was, what if we lower this requirement to simple three universal hashing? Three universal hashing can be just implemented by uh, XORs, simple linear uh, hash functions. Which is uh, which is something set solvers can deal with. But the problem it poses is that all cells you can show that if you just use three universal hashing, all cells are not guaranteed to be small, and this is true with high probability. So the question: at no point all the cells will be small, and this will be true with high probability. Some of the cells will be small, but at no point we will reach a stage where all the cells are small. But it is still possible that the fraction of cells that are large is very small. That's a uh, good observation and that's what we observe. While all the cells are not going to be small, the majority of the cells are going to be small. So what uh, we did, we said that well we are only interested in a randomly picked cell and this randomly picked cell is guaranteed to be small with high probability. So I know the probability that all the cells are small at some point is very low, but since the, uh, at the same time majority of the cells are small with high probability, so what you can do is that you just pick a cell and you check whether it is small. And this event is going to be true with high probability. And this allowed us to give the guarantees of almost uniformity. Uh, so, what are all, uh, what is almost uniformity? So, we started with uniformity. What do we mean by uniformity? If y is a solution, we want that probability y's output should be 1 or rf. What is rf? f is the input formula, rf is the solution space, cardinality of rf is the total number of satisfying assignments. 
So using an universal hashing, um, it is possible to give uh, the guarantee of uniformity. What we have been able to show is that using three universal hashing, we have a guarantee of uh, that probability deviates uh, within the uh, one plus epsilon factor. This is still strong enough for almost all the practical applications because it, what it proves is that we are not going to miss some solutions trivially. If you run all the solutions have non trivial probability lower bound. Um, again, the method uh, unison lied in the, poly uh, the number of set calls we wanted was polynomial number of set calls. So, one thing that I did not go too much into detail is what is a cell? Well, a cell in this case is a conjunction of the original formula and uh, since our hash function can be just represented by a set of XORs, so it is a conjunction of the formula with m random XOR constraints where 2 raised to m is the number of cells uh, that we desire. This formula is uh, since uh, usually the input formula is given in the form of CNF. So, what we have is CNF and XORs and crypto mini set um, and uh, handles these kind of formulas natively that really allows us to scale to large uh, formulas. So, how well we did uh, with um, in performance? To do this, we compared Unigen with XR sample prime. I am um, presenting only for a subset of benchmarks. We have comparisons over uh, 200 plus benchmarks. So, on Y axis, I have the time on log scale. On X axis, a subset of benchmarks. What we see is that we beat uh, XR sample prime comprehensively. Even in the, in the cases where it is able to um, almost since the time was 18,000, so in a lot of cases it just times out. In the cases where it is able to do something, uh, Unigen is still two to three orders of magnitude faster. What I would like to point out is that XR sample prime has very weak guarantees compared to Unigen. <coughs> so, where are we with respect to the scale with which we wanted to measure ourselves? So, the mean relative runtime comes around to be 450. So, we did pretty well compared to the state of art um, as technique, but still not, uh, not to the point where we wanted to get. So, how can we go to the um, or holy grail of uh, achieving something that EDA industry wants? To do this, we went to the next step which is uh, independence among samples. What do I mean by that? So, before that, a quick question. So, how many solutions are generated per sample? Remember the technique, the answer is greater than log rate. What? Why? Because we pick a random cell, we check if it is small, and then we pick a solution randomly from this cell. So, we generate up to log rate number of solutions, and we pick one solution randomly. And number of solutions in a small cell is between low thresh and high thresh. So we generate every, every such event at least requires generation of at least low thresh number of solutions. What if we pick low thresh number of solutions instead of one solution from this cell? It's not so easy, and why it is not, we will have to go back to uh, hashing. So, uh, what we are using is three universal hashing. So, again, what uh, it means is that every input is hashed uniformly and every three solution set is hashed independently, but the same does not hold for a set of four solutions. Why does that matter? Well, if we were choosing up to three sa uh, samples, then we could have guaranteed that there is full independence among solutions. And the question is, why do we, okay, first, why do we care so much about the independence? So, we care so much about independence because our event, our, our motivating goal was to uh, achieve coverage, which is to hit a, uh, find a bug quickly. 
So think about this being the set of all solutions, dots again are satisfying solutions and the buggy inputs are within this circle, the blue circle. So if I, if I pick a solution independently every time and uniformly then you can see that we are going to hit the buggy set in expectation which is going to be the number of solutions in the buggy set divided by total number of solutions. If we don't have independence and suppose I generate this solution first and then my next solution is not generated independently then we might go in some path while missing this completely for a long time. So every time when we do um, any kind of uh, coverage proofs, we require consequent runs to be independent. And in this case, we would want our samples to be independent. What is interesting and what we were able to show is, yes, choosing low threshold number of samples makes you lose the full independence guarantee. But what uh, we were able to show is that it still has something called almost independence. So while not complete independence, the probabilities still have lower and upper bounds with respect to uh, So if probability of A and B is lower and upper bounded by again some epsilon factors. And this still provides theoretical guarantees of coverage. So I will not go into uh, uh, proofs, uh, uh, but I will be very happy to talk about after the talk. But uh, in nutshell, what we had, if L is the number of samples that we generate, then so again for a solution Y belonging in the RF, where F is the input formula, RF is the solution space, probability Y is output is lower and upper bounded, but there is a constant in the numerator which is L. So where L is the number of samples. It's something to observe, this is weaker than what we had earlier. The earlier guarantee implies this, but not the other way. However, this is pretty strong enough and what is more interesting is that we can reduce the number of set calls per sample from polynomial to constant, which is a big win. Why? Well, the, our original motivation was being able to uh, guarantee the coverage, so we wanted to hit the bug with high probability. So let's call that the bug frequency f, which is the number of uh, number of uh, solutions or number of samples that are going to trigger bug B over the total number of samples. So um, while going while doing all the computation, we can arrive at two theoretical expressions, which is the relative number of set calls we will have to do to hit the bugs with uh, some probability, where nu is, uh, is function of uh, the probability that we want to hit with, and nu prime again has some constants. I really um, instead of going very much into the what does every term mean, to simplify the number of set calls that we would require for unigen 2, it's far, far less than the number of set calls that we require for unigen. And this is very much important for us because we use set solo at the back end and sets calling, calling set solo is what takes the most amount of the time. So how do these numbers look in practice? If uh, buck frequency is 1 by 10 raised to 4, so every one input in 10,000, uh, every one sample in 10,000 samples is going to uh, trigger a bug. And suppose we want to find bug with probability at least half, then expected number of set calls for unigen is going to be 10 raised to 4, 4.3 into 10 raised to 7, for unigen 2 it is 3.3 into 10 raised to 6. The difference between these numbers increase as f decreases which is good because as we do more and more iterations in our verification, uh, the probability that uh, more uh, samples are going to trigger bug is going to go at smaller. Uh, you expect your smartphones not to have bug in every five touches you do. <coughs> so 
even in uh, this case we have an order of magnitude difference and as it goes further and further in the verification cycles where the bugs are going to be less and less likely uh, the difference goes more and more so you need to uh, outperform unison completely by um, more orders of magnitude in number of set calls we do uh, well, that's yeah. what, yeah, the, um, what, so we'll go back and compare how well we do in terms of, uh, um, you know, we have the metric uh, which is how, how much slowdown we have for unison 2 and it will be interesting to see where do we stand here. Uh, before that, um, there were a few more modifications that I did not discuss. But what we were allowed, uh, what we were able to accomplish is uh, improve Unigen by uh, the performance of Unigen by tw uh, 20x factor. So again, we perform 20 times better than Unigen in Unigen 2. So now going back, what we, what we have ended up with is that Unigen 2 is about 20 times slower than just making a simple set code. We are getting there, still not where we want it to be. So that brings me to the final uh, part of the talk, which is uh, parallelization. How, how we can um, use parallelization. So before that, uh, I want to give a bit of overview of how verification works in industry and practice. So what we uh, have is we have simulators. Simulators mimic the design. You give, a input, you give a test vector, they give you the output. So we have simulators. Simulators can run in parallel. They don't have to have any communication. So currently, we have a current uh, way of uh, verification uh, is that we have a test generator and we have simulators. So um, test generator outputs a test vector. This is run our simulator. And we have a lot of simulators uh, in um, working in parallel. So uh, test generator keeps giving them inputs. However, the current techniques uh, that are used by industry, uh, they cannot have test generator in the parallel state because these test generators maintain some sort of global state. What do they have? They say that, well, I have explored this part of the solution space and this, this information they use in the conjugate iterations of uh, generation of test vectors. So if you just parallelize all of them, all of them are going to generate the same test vectors, which is completely useless. So the current uh, techniques indeed lose any third, if they have any theoretical guarantees of uniformity, if you try to parallelize. What is a bit interesting in our case is that we have some pre-processing, which is to compute the number of cells, which I did not discuss. So we have some initial pre-processing stage, which is to compute the number of cells, which is a small part. Once we do this pre-processing, the test generation can happen completely in parallel. No communication is required between test generators once the initial pre-processing stage is done. <coughs> because None of our proofs depend on what was generated earlier in terms of uh, uniformity or um, any kind of independence guarantees. So this, remember, this is not f uh, possible in the current state of our techniques that are used by the EDA industry. So we need to do pre-processing only once. We don't uh, require any communication between different copies of test generated. So we scale linearly with the number of cores in practice. And this allows us to get where we want it to be. So with just two cores, now we are able to achieve the performance um, that is what EDA industry wants, uh, while still giving the theoretical guarantees of coverage and uniformity. So um, one of the things that I did not talk about, how well we do in practice. In terms, we have the theoretical guarantees of uniformity, but how well we do in practice. 
So we took some benchmark that had low number of solutions because we wanted to compare with the ideal uniform generator. So if it has small number of solutions, we can enumerate all those solutions and then pick one of the solutions randomly. So that was our ideal generator. Just enumerate all the solutions and pick one of them randomly. So uh, I'm going to show results for one of the benchmarks. So this benchmark has 16,000 solutions. We generated 4 million samples for ideal Unigen 2 and parallel version of Unigen 2. What we did then is to group solutions according to their frequency. So every since we are generating 4 million times, we are generating 4 million samples while the total number of solutions are just 16,000. Every solution is going to occur a lot of times, so we group solution according to their frequency. And then we plot number of solutions versus frequency. So basically a point two hundred and comma two hundred fifty says that two hundred fifty solutions appeared two hundred times each. Um, if, you, if the underlying generators are uniform generators, then uh, in theory we can show that we should expect a Poisson distribution. And since we don't have the guarantees of uh, uh, uniformity, so I guess it would be very easy for all of you to identify which one is what. One of them is parallel uniform generator, one of them is Unigen 2, um, on single core and one of them is ideal. If you think you are not able to, don't worry because statistically they are indistinguishable and this is the observation we have on all the benchmarks we are experimented. So, well, if you are still wondering, so the yellow one turns out to be the ideal. Um, red is Unigen 2 and uh, the blue is parallel version of Unigen 2. So in practice again, uh, while we have uh, theoretical proofs, but uh, yeah, the, implemented, the implementation of these still have uh, uniform gen gen uh, behave as, as if the, and they are ideal uniform generators. This was with what setting for epsilon? Uh, this was uh, setting epsilon to 16, one by um, epsilon uh, set to um, 15, uh, 1 plus epsilon. So this was with 1 six plus epsilon is 16. Epsilon is not a number between 0 and 1? Uh, no, oh, well, epsilon can be greater than 1 and 1. Yes. This is not mean a probability can exceed bound, or bound is not. Uh, <coughs> uh, no, because it is 1 plus epsilon, the RF is very huge. Yes, you can choose uh, such numbers, but then they would be so completely uninteresting. You ran all your experiments with the same value actually? Yeah. Um, and these experiments, we did different experiments for different things, but these experiments, the uniform Because your runtime also depends on epsilon, right? Yeah. The more uniform we want, I imagine, the complex, complex uh, It is one by epsilon, the dependence on the epsilon. So uh, one of the things that uh, we have been sort of uh, working on all the time is to improve, uh, because what we observe is 1 by 16 seems to be really bad, but this is what we get. And uh, this sort of indicates that our proofs are very conservative currently, and they can be improved. So, so do you also have this graph for the um, well, not this graph, we had some other graphs of uh, uniformity comparison and it bears pretty well. Okay, so uh, now uh, to conclude, um, so as I told, uh, the story so far has been spreading of uh, independence. So initially we started with hashing where we wanted to relax independence. We had n universal hash functions which were behaving, at giving these n wise independent events. Now we went all the way down to three universal hash functions. We lost uniformity and we uh, ended up with almost uniformity which is still as good as uh, um, uniformity for uh, all our practical applications. But what we were really able to gain is two to three orders of magnitude performance improvement with respect to the state of art generators, 
Uh, compared to the techniques, uh, the theoretical techniques, uh, this was a huge improvement because those techniques could scale only to formalize the 10 to 20 variables. Uh, then we went and we said, well, uh, why, why we are generating samples independently? How about we relax uh, some independence among samples? Uh, we got beacon guarantees of almost uniformity, uh, but we still had theoretical guarantees of coverage. We get 20x improvement. Um, these techniques are parallelizable and we achieve desired performance. One of the lessons that has been for uh, in the whole journey is that uh, there, there have been techniques which lose independence completely and that's where the problem uh, arises because once you lose complete independence then you cannot give any theoretical guarantees of uniformity or coverage. Uh, so in the whole journey we have been trading off uh, independence uh, for scalability but carefully. So, um, if afternoon lunch was too heavy, here is what uh, I think um, our, our takeaways from uh, this talk. Uh, uniform generation is key problem, has diverse applications. Uh, I discuss only one of them, there are other applications. Uh, uh, what we propose is the first scalable parallel approach that provi provides strong guarantees and scales to formulas uh, that arise in the real world. It requires constant number of set calls per sample. Uh, scales linearly with the number of cores and we achieve uh, what has been the desired performance uh, um, given to us by our EDF uh, partners and they, have, they are now working on uh, implementing this in their tools. Thank you, I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. And this is a new paradigm that we So how did you choose the dump frequency to 1 by 10 raised to 4? Oh, that was just to show how does those uh, you know, mathematical expressions evaluate. Usually, bug frequency is what far worse than 1 by 10 raised to 4. 1 by 10 raised to yeah. 4 means um, yeah, the design is very much uh, screwed up right now. So, the, so, one general question is that if the idea is to find out how cases They write these corner cases where you want to test them, but uh, the no the number of corner cases they have is still too large that you cannot try on all those corner cases. So what you want to do, you don't know where exactly now the bug lies. For example, suppose you design a simple division circuit, you say, well, let's try around zero, but you don't know whether the bug lies in you know, 0.001 or 0.002. So in that case, um, what you can do is you can only try on few test vectors. Um, because usually you have some time bound you. Yeah, you so the, can the can those few vectors be from the non-representative samples? Non-representative samples. There is a representative sample and the non-representative sample. Um, how do you correct? So, so of course we start with those uh, corner cases. These are the constraints that come from uh, the engineers. And f from these corner cases, um, you can try only on few samples. So which ones you want to choose? Since you don't know anything more after this, you know that these are corner cases, but you don't know anything more, you don't know anything more where exactly the bug might be found. So your best bet is that you randomly sample or uniformly sample. So yes, we um, the whole process starts with the corner cases that are, uh, or the design, or the verification scenarios, which are formula, which are usually written by verification engineers. So if you know what is representative and what is non-representative, put that in the constraints so that you're solving only for the non-representative. If you're using any criterion to classify something as representative or non-representative. No, I don't know what is representative. 
is that's the problem. Once you do not know what is represented in the mind, okay, every solution looks equally good or equally bad. If you have some idea of classifying given two solutions, one is equal to the put the classification into constraints itself. So that your constraints are not generating, every solution is an unknown. So now among them, so you sample when you have no other metric to distinguish. Now loud, louder, please. How do you use speed processing which ensures that you don't use tested in the family of the interpretation? I couldn't. Speed processing is speed processing. Oh, so uh, well, uh, this is something I did not talk about. Pre-processing is uh, um, counting the number of cells you should divide into, and uh, we have a very simple linear way, which is divide into one cell, pick a random cell. If it has, if the number of solutions are between uh, high thresh and low thresh, then you say that this is the right number of uh, cells to divide into. If not, you divide into. So you do, you start with one cell, you divide into two cells, you divide into four cells. You basically just keep increasing the value of n, and at one point, you end up uh, in a, you basically end up in a, um, for a value of n where one of the randomly chosen cell uh, happens to be small, and you say, well, this is going to be my n from now on, and you can show that um, this look dumb looking way gives all kinds of guarantees. The number of cells is very important. You will fit the right number of cells. So that is the key process. Once you know that number, then you make each one of them is divided independently into that many number of cells. They are not randomly edited, so the number of cells are the same. Um, yeah. Well, so the whole idea is that since there is no dep they don't have any sort of dependence, so you could have thought of that, uh, you know, f one generating four samples or four, uh, all four of them generating one sample each, uh, the behavior is exactly the same. So um, you expect because if you generate four uh, random samples, then you expect that you are covering more spot. So of course, theoretically, there is still a very, very, very small probability that uh, these have generated the same samples. Um, we did a live demo at Takas this time. We were running on uh, four cores for the whole demo, 90 minutes. And uh, all of them generated about uh, 100,000 samples, and they didn't repeat any samples. Uh, it's still not to say that there is theoretical probability zero, but um, it usually just doesn't happen. There is a theory that the three universal hacking generates near uniform, uh, what is it, uh, near uniform, uh, some of the cells. This yeah. And this is for any arbitrary input formula? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, again to repeat, I showed, I kept showing circle because that was the easiest to draw, but there is no assumption on uh, the uh, formula we start with, and the space is of course not convex.